TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see a little warning screen just in case. Patreon.com. Premier League highlights, UK movies, UK uh, series. We watch them there. And then we also got Twitch.com. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. This is the Night of Salford Gangster. The, the Night Salford Gangsters Butchered Hacienda Bouncer. Okay, talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. And they had a machete. And uh, one of the gang lads that was about, so... I just chopped its head off and carried it inside the pub and put it on the pool table. And uh, more or less told them and asked them to stay away from the hacienda. Or the next time it be a humanid. And they never came back. Manchester, June 1991. Six bouncers working for Top Guard security were violently stabbed and slashed by a gang. This is the reasons why I would never be a bouncer. I would never even thought about it. Especially in Chicago, they'd be shooting them. Just saying. Said to be like a wild pack of hyenas terrorizing clubbers as they carried out the brutal attack mob handed. But who was responsible? And why did they attack the London door firm who had won the contract for the Hacienda in 1990? Well, that's, that's obvious answers. Whoever controls the door controls the drugs. The London door firm who had won the contract for the Hacienda in 1991. The iconic Hacienda nightclub had reopened a month earlier and years of violence had forced the co-founder of Factory Records, Tony Wilson, to shut the popular music venue temporarily. In 1982, the managers behind two seminal Manchester bands, Joy Division and New Order, converted an old red brick warehouse into a multi-floor nightclub. The Hacienda hosted an era-defining roster of rockers, including the Smiths, the Stone Roses, and Oasis. But that wasn't the scene that turned it into a money-making Yeah, people was definitely trying to pop, pop something in there, man. Pause. ...machine thwarted by gang problems. New Order had headed to the Spanish party island of Ibiza to record an album in 1986. And that's when the whole club scene erupted, along with ecstasy, says oh, Peter Hook, New Order's no, bassist. X. We saw it, we brought people over to witness it, and we brought it back to Manchester. At first, it was just once a week, an Ibiza-style hot night, with palm trees, ice pops and loads of pills, all set to the pounding beats of Chicago house music and Detroit techno. Talk to me. Chicago house music, which spawned into what out in the UK? But that grew and the Hacienda became the spot for 100,000 local university students and ravers across Manchester and the north. Podiums that you can climb onto that hold sort of like say 10, 12 people and the stage that holds possibly like 100 and everyone's chanting to each other and everyone's arms are going out to each other in time. Everyone dances in time, everyone moves in time to the music. With the club scene thriving, ecstasy exploded, says Hook. All these middle-class kids were selling drugs, 30 pounds a tab, they were making shit loads of money. It didn't take long for gangsters to spot what was happening. Between the first Ibiza night in 1988 and the self-imposed temporary closure in early 1991, there had been numerous acts of violence from warring gangs trying to take a foothold in the drug market. A feared gangster named White Tony Johnson and a gang from Cheatham Hill had threatened the door staff with guns after being refused entry. And, and that's when I would have quit. The management had decided enough was enough. They needed to hit the pause button and rethink the security strategy. Precisely. Anthony Johnson was allied with the Cheatham Hill gangs who specialised in armed robbery and drug distribution. They were at war with the notorious Moss Side gangs, but operated a more sophisticated criminal organisation involved in high-level armed robberies as well as drugs. Johnson was raised by grandmother Winnie Bennett, whose son Keith had been murdered by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. The house he grew up in had a shrine to Bennett, 
whose body was never recovered from the moors. While his grandmother was consumed with grief, Tony set about making a name for himself as a gangster. The Cheatham Hill crew liked his bravado and soon gave him a job driving a gang leader around in a top-of-the-range Cosworth. He was also at the front of the Cheatham Hillbillies War with Moss Side and was reported to be a suspect in the murder of a rival gangster, Anthony Scratch Gardner. An armed robbery, the police believe Anthony... So this, this dude was real dangerous in general. So when he said that he had come through and, 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 and blow this place down, the Hacienda, he, they took it for real and they shut it down. It was all right. Manchester, y'all can't have nothing nice, apparently. And he was involved in was the catalyst for his brutal murder, a short period before the Hacienda decided to reopen its doors. Over 300,000 was stolen in a security van robbery at Mumpsbridge Oldham in November 1990, and until the heat cooled down, Anthony, allegedly, left £70,000 of the proceeds with a friend by the name of Desmond Noonan. That's how that was done. We've got more guns in the police, silly bastards. I'm down to 20, 25 murders. Wow, a load of bollocks, innit? 24, one of you done. No, I didn't do 24. The Noonans, a powerful Manchester... I remember that. That was on what, Danny Dyer? Manchester crime family of Irish roots had come to prominence with four of the brothers, Damien, Desi, Dominic and Derek, putting their stamp on the city. Armed robberies, drugs, pubs and security were their business and they had a relationship with the Cheatham Hill Gang. It was subsequently alleged in court a row broke out over the money when Desi only offered 40,000 of the 70,000 back to Anthony Johnson. Johnson erupted in fury and threats were made towards Desi and his brothers. It was a fatal mistake. Anthony and his friend Tony McKee met with the Noonan brothers and their friends. Wheelchair-bound Paul Flannery and Michael Sharples outside the Penny Black pub in Cheatham. Oh, so bro, okay. Bro, let them borrow seventy thousand dollars back, man. They said, "Look, bro, we only we'll give you forty back for holding it." Probably said something like that, and he wasn't going for that because that wasn't in the original terms. He my homies, just hold it down. And they and then he started throwing threats, and they was like, "I right, bet, stand on it. We want to slide." <laughs> Owned you by are. Derek Noonan, he's alleged a row broke out, and Anthony and his friend were both shot by Flannery. As Anthony tried to make his escape. He was caught and executed with a shot to the back Damn. and head. McKee survived and managed to get away despite being wounded. The men were charged with murder and McKee was the star witness against them. He claimed he only turned Queen's evidence due to him and his partner receiving death threats. Desai, Flannery and the brothers you gotta move. argued they were friends with Anthony and had no reason to kill him. They claimed the allegations were made up due to a deal McKee had made with the gang responsible for the killing. The formidable QC Michael Mansfield defended the men, and despite death threats to Mary Monson's criminal solicitors, who represented the Noonans, they were all sensationally cleared by the jury and found not guilty. These shocking incidents unknowingly to the Hacienda club owners would lead to the Noonans becoming an integral part of the club's lucrative but violent future. Tony Wilson and his co-founders had returned full of optimism that they could solve the security issues at the Hacienda. On reopening in 1991, they had employed Top Guard Security, a big London firm who had assured them they had the manpower and experience to deal with the threats the Manchester gangs posed. They housed three head doormen in a secure flat in Manchester. And How can you make that type of promise when you're not armed as security guards? These is real gangsters with bodies. <laughs> like, you can't make no promises of safety if you ain't if you ain't toting toting firearms you know what i'm saying and that, and this is the uk so you're not and the majority 50 strong door team would be shuttled in every weekend from london this way with minimal local doormen intimidation would be more difficult white tony johnson their chief protagonist had been killed in an underworld dispute and in a naive peace offering they reached out to gang heads to invite them free of charge to the venue. That was dumb as f that that was real dumb. They hoped this would appease them enough to keep their gangs from trying to muscle the new door team. The Moss Side gangs were not a problem for the club, 
They only came down for the jungle night, but the Cheatham Hill gang still posed potential threats. So a new membership scheme with metal detectors had been brought in to wean out potential troublemakers. The police refused requests to help man the door, but wanted certain criteria to be met to appease themselves and the council. The reopening night was much publicised with big numbers queuing around the block to sign up for the new membership scheme. Bouncers juiced to the gills, wearing paramilitary style uniforms patrolled the doorways. Alsatian dogs strained at their leashes as revellers filtered through the specially designed detectors to check for weapons. One party goer, Ryan Day, who was there on the night, said the- Bro, if I'm a regular law-abiding Patreon patron and, and I just peep all of this going on, it's dogs, it's military, it's- is metal to I'm not going in there. I don't give a I don't care how fun it look or sound. I ain't doing that. The atmosphere was menacing but tinged with excitement. He had witnessed fights in the venue before, with dealers being battered with champagne bottles by rival fractions, but the hedonistic music and the ecstasy scene that went with it made the hacienda unmissable. He just you know what I'm saying? There's a bunch of hypes in there. You wanna be so high that you're willing to risk your life. No sir described to me the moment he was queuing, when a large group of smartly dressed lads rocked up to the front entrance, 40 handed, and forced their way past the helpless doorman. These lads, according to a news report in a subsequent Daily Mirror report, were the Cheatham Hill Gang. Four. It read, a drug gang gate crashed the grand reopening of Britain's trendiest club, despite tough security. 30 thugs barged past bouncers at Manchester's Hacienda night spot, closed three months ago, after violence between warring gangs. 60 police officers backed by a riot vehicle were called to throw out the smartly dressed Cheatham Hill mob after they refused management pleas to leave. Despite the beefed up security, the same old issues with the Cheatham Hill gang had resurfaced on opening night. However, Cheatham had problems of their own to deal with and it was another powerful gang that made their move to muscle in on the lucrative night spot. You get the rise of Salford. And our problems then became Salford based. Not from down Regent Road here to take over and become the prime force in town. While the two black gangs from over there, the Gooch and the Pepper Tree on my side, uh, we had very little to do with except once every six months when we did a jungle night. Like a phoenix, Salford. That sounds racist. I'm not even going to lie. Yeah, the black gangs only came when there was jungle night. Excuse me? Jungle, what? <laughs> but Rose Life, a great big effing bird, from the flames of rubbish burning on the Ordsall estate, a great big effing what do you mean by that? bird with wild staring eyes and a beak that would peck your effing head off if you dared to return its stare. Tony Wilson, Paul Massey and his friends were smart enough to know that there was money to be made at the Hacienda. Massey, they had controlled the upstairs at another Manchester club conspiracy before it closed in 1990 when a student was stabbed. The Salford lads were large in number, pulling tough working class lads from across the Salford estates. Massey, recently released from a prison sentence, saw the change in Manchester's club scene. Before getting sent down, the Quality Street gang ran all the pubs and clubs, but time had moved on and the young, unruly Salford lads were taking charge. The QSG had no interest in the rave scene and were all now established businessmen and very wealthy. They had already bumped heads with the Salford firm, which had left several of their men badly injured and were happy to keep their noses out of the ecstasy trough. An opportunity arose to make a show of the London doorman and make- Make a show of the London doorman is crazy. Well, let's not act like back in those days, the London doorman was innocent. They was out there doing the most as well. So, hey. An opportunity arose to make a show of the London doorman and make some high level chess moves to get what they ultimately wanted. The Control doorman. of the club. There had been some incidents between the London doorman and Salford residences, and Paul Massey believed it amounted to disrespect. He rallied the lads and told them they should not stand for such disrespect, and they charged up to the venue wheel spinning outside before threatening the doorman. Massey, jumping out of his car, went up to the entrance and told them in no uncertain terms that he and his friends ran Manchester and all the clubs, not the doorman. They were told to let anyone from Salford in free or there would be trouble. It did not take long for reports to filter back that one muscle-bound doorman had thrown out one of the Salford lot's daughter's boyfriend for dealing. That to Massey was the excuse he needed. One night soon after the Salford lads made their move, 
They arrived at the club in huge numbers, armed to the teeth, but the doorman had wisely locked the entrance. One of the staff inside the club opened a side door for them, and the young Salford men flooded in like starving hyenas and began attacking the bouncers, smashing, stabbing and glassing them in a frenzied attack. The doormen were on foreign soil and had quickly realised this was a thankless task and had the fight knocked out of them as one from the local area was glassed and stabbed four times in the thigh. Another was stabbed with a Rambo knife, only a rib bone saving his life. Some of the bouncers ran and clubbers fled the dance floor as the remaining security were driven back to the main bar and battered mercilessly. Police arrived quickly and sealed everyone inside and a helicopter purred above with spotlights to unveil any gang members on the loose. It was a swift... Dead Lee! Yeah. Nah. Who, like, mm mm-mm. Back, mm mm-mm, hell nah. I don't even got nothing to say, it's just a no. ...and vicious attack that hospitalised six doormen with knife wounds and made unwanted headline news. The owners realised they still had a major problem on their hands and the only way forward was to do a deal with the devil. Shortly after they announced a deal with a local Salford security firm and none other than the imperious Damien Noonan, recently cleared of murder, was given the head doorman's job. Damien was close friends with Paul Massey and before you knew it, the Salford lads led by Massey made themselves at home at the Hacienda as their lucrative stomping ground. Over the next few years until it's Whatever the, it worked. closure in June 1997, Massey and the Salford lot made thousands of pounds and controlled the Hacienda with an iron fist. The combination of the Noonans, Salford and the likes of former armed robber Jason Coughlin helping with security, they were a very powerful unit. But nothing lasts forever. And as the Hacienda had its day in 1997, in the next two decades, Paul Massey, Desi Noonan, Damien Nonan, and many figures from the underworld in Manchester, as usual, same old script, Manchester, would meet their death. Legendary club owner Tony Wilson passed away from natural causes, but left an amazing legacy that will be etched into music history forevermore. So you can't even club in peace out here. Well, it's pretty expected though, man. I ain't no possible Paul Massey had nothing to do with this little story, but I should have figured. It's Manchester. <laughs>